sermon this morning will be a bit different because I'm calling it simply learning from history. And the text I'm using is a little bit lengthy. It's 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. 1 Peter 1, 1 through 9. And even though it's a little lengthy, I would like for you to read it along with me. 1 Peter 1, 1 through 9. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you, and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed at the last time. Wherein ye greatly rejoice, Though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen ye love, in whom though now ye see him not, Yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your soul. It's obvious he's writing to Christians. And Peter was the apostle to the Jews. And thus, they would have that kind of background. But as you hold those thoughts in mind, I think you see that Peter is attempting to comfort the brethren as he starts out this letter. And if you go with me to the year 64 in the first century, we learn that in that year a major fire broke out in the city of Rome, the capital of the Roman Empire. And coincidentally, at least it seems so. The fire centered in the poorer sections of the city. Now many suspect Nero, the Caesar, of ordering the burning uh, for the express purpose of, uh, uh, purpose of clearing space for improvements uh, and to move untoward elements from the city. But you're dealing with people who are dishonest and you're dealing with people who have power that we haven't ever known one man really to have as far as uh, our government is concerned. And he shifted the blame for that fire to Christians. Now how long has it been since the Lord's church was established? Just a little over 30 years. And we read Paul's letter to the Romans. We read in closing chapters of Acts his trip to Rome and his work there. He has some other comments in other letters about his work there. But we must know that Christians were not popular. They weren't popular because they did not support the traditional religions of the pagans, and the idolatry and all that went along with it. They would oppose and speak out against and argue against the popular practices of heavy drinking and every way they had of getting drunk and, and promiscuous sex. Their loyalty was suspected as they did not join in the worship of the emperor. In short, it was a political move to make them the scapegoats and to keep Nero separate from any criticism. It is thought that Peter's first letter then was written at the beginning 
of that persecution. Now, this was the first time that the Roman government, as such, had persecuted Christians. The kind of persecution that they had undergone previous to this, you can read of in the book of Acts. It was more localized by unbelieving Jews and them stirring up Gentiles and so forth and trying to get government officials to uh, oppose Christians. So Peter is encouraging his brethren because it is a time of intense hatred, all manner of violence and suffering. And he wants them to continue to be faithful and in doing so to offer evidence of the truthfulness of Christianity. I think it's interesting to note that none of these men in the church, the apostles in particular, or you think of the first Christian martyr, Stephen, they did not say, well, it's raining today. We can't be Christians. And they did not tell the church, now, the people around you don't like you, so be quiet. Forget the Great Commission. <laughs> we remember there in Jerusalem that once a great persecution following the death of Stephen came upon the church, the whole church scattered abroad from Jerusalem, save the apostles. And what did they do? They went everywhere preaching the word, and that characterized the church. And that's one reason it spread so fast in those 30 years from the time that the church was established in Jerusalem down to the present time. We need to take books like this, and when we get to thinking that everything is falling to pieces, and everything's terribly bad and all these kind of things and realize that um, well, we have it good compared to those folks. And even if it gets as bad as it got then and has gotten in other places in the world, that is no excuse for quitting being faithful and certainly no excuse to stop preaching the gospel because that was, that's what Peter is doing in this letter. He's saying as bad as it is, and as much as people are opposing you, and as much suffering as you're undergoing, you defend the truth. You live righteous lives. You speak out against error, and you uphold the gospel of Jesus Christ. So notice that the letter starts out addressed to aliens, if you please, pilgrims, People who are temporary residents in a foreign country, 1 Peter 1.1. 1, 1. Strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. What does that tell you about the mindset that the early church had concerning its relationship with this present world? That is, you're just traveling through. You don't put down roots. You don't do those particular things because you're going to be out of this world. And your reward is outside this world. 1 Peter 2 and 11, he will talk about us being aliens or strangers to the world that we live in. One of the ways that Christians can tell whether they are what God wants them to be is how much as the, year, as the years go by, they're totally uncomfortable in this world. I talked to a preacher last week, and he was talking about how he feels like that we must be undergoing a lot of what Lot underwent in Sodom, that he was vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. And that's the way it gets more and more. And these people were in the same way, our brothers and sisters in Christ of almost 2,000 years ago. The world would be foreign to us and is to the faithful child of God. And its ways would be awkward to the faithful child of God, would be uncomfortable to us. Because the world is sensual, it's material, it operates on the basis of the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And John tells Christians, that those things will pass away. 
when the world goes and the lust thereof. It's not that we are forcing ourselves to deny ourselves pleasure. It is that we are developing a character that does not want what the world has to offer. In 2 Timothy 2, in verse 22, Paul told Timothy to flee. Let's run as fast as you can, as quick as you can. Youthful lust. Now, the world flocks to those youthful lusts. The entertainment business and Hollywood and television and all such things, they don't run the other way. They call everybody to that way. The Christian goes the other direction. We're not to leave any openings at all. Romans 13, verses 13 and 14. The lust of the flesh will conduct a full-fledged war against us. It's not an isolated skirmish, but it is a full campaign to destroy our souls. The devil is as a roaring lion going about seeking whom he may devour. So we must, in the midst of this perverse generation, as they did, we must be careful about our conduct. And Peter makes that clear in 1 Peter 2 and verse 12. When in a foreign country, you're careful not to cause offense by violating some custom that maybe with itself is either right or wrong as far as the Bible's concerned, but you don't want to create, create a wrong state of mind in people in something that's neither here nor there with us. We don't want to violate those customs. I've mentioned several of those from time to time. And we won't go back over them now, but they've always existed. Christians care about that because no man's an island to himself. We don't live to ourselves. We don't die to ourselves. Our lives influence others for good or bad. All sorts of lies were spread about Christians at this time. Christians shunned the world, so they were considered to be unfriendly. If you don't go to my wild party, then there's something wrong with you. And maybe before they became Christians, they did. Peter says, once you are converted, then you don't do those things you once did as a worldly person. And they think it's a strange thing that you don't do that. And, of course, the way the pagans saw it is that every... Sunday, they ate the body and drank the blood of Christ, and they considered that barbaric because they weren't fully informed on the worship of the church and the Lord's Supper. The Roman historian Tacitus, one of our main sources for Roman history, said that Christians were a, and I'm quoting, a class hated for their abominations. And I assure you that those abominations were in the minds of the pagans. They were rumors. They were slanderous reports. In Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 and 16, we're taught how to live in this world, redeeming the time. That is, we've lived too long, however short it may have been, in service to self and sin and rebellion to God. So when you're converted to Christ and a new creature in Christ, you buy back the time. You start using it like the Bible says Christians are to use it. And he says it's because the days are evil. Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Well, how cautious or each one of us, as they were instructed to be, about the way that we talk and the way we act in the presence of those who are not Christians, who may be believing all sorts of slanderous reports made about us. And the more the nation gets more secular, governed more by atheism, and a don't-care attitude about religion, 
or do as you please and don't judge me and all that kind of thing, then the more, because they're moving further away from any influence of the Bible, they're apt to think no anything what of real, genuine, faithful New Testament Christians. We must realize that in this world, as pilgrims and strangers, we are representing God's country, God's nation, the kingdom of God, the body of Christ, of which we're members in particular and citizens of the kingdom of heaven, the church, if you please. That's who we represent. Are we aware that the world will judge our fellow countrymen, our brothers and sisters in Christ, our fellow citizens, by the way that we behave before the unbeliever. We refute slanderous charges by excellent behavior. Again, Colossians 3.17, whatsoever you do, in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father by Him. Now, keeping an excellent behavior means behavior that is praiseworthy action on our part. It's not just abstaining from lust, but it's being active in doing what is right as the Bible defines the right. As the church is to live, as God has commissioned each member of the church to conduct his or her life. We are created, according to Paul in Ephesians 2.10, we are created to do good works. We must always decide what is a good work on the basis of what the Bible describes as good works for members of the church. When you look at Matthew 25, 35 through 36 as a preview of the judgment, you see that those people that were acceptable to the Lord were concerned about their fellow man. They had the milk of human kindness. They were not self-centered, just doing what it was to suit them. They clothed the naked. They fed the hungry. They visited the prisoners. And of course, all of that is involved as they preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, that Christ is the one who saves and the only one who saves. It's on his terms. He is the only mediator between God and man. I might mention this about prisoners at that time. We, we ordinarily think of prisoners being arrested and charged with some heinous crime. And the state takes care of all of that while they're in jail. And this is not being opposed to efforts where you can do so to teach the Bible in jails and prisons and other places of incarceration. But in those days, you had people thrown into jail who were perfectly good and wholesome people. They might not be able to pay their bills. They were thrown into debtor prison. Or for other things of that nature. And if family and friends did not provide for them, especially if they got sick, or provide for them as far as food is concerned and clothing, they didn't get it. So when the Lord talks about visiting the sick, the word visit carries with it the same idea of James 1.27, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction. It means to provide for them what they need that they cannot provide for themselves. You're not just necessarily dealing with murderers and rapists. So you must understand the prison situation of that time and the kind of people that were there. I didn't mean you wouldn't do good for somebody that was a murderer. You'd like to see him obey the gospel too. But it meant that we need to understand the context of the times and being in prison and why the Lord uh, pictures at the judgment part of being faithful to those who visited in prison, supplied those things they couldn't get. The purpose is not to clear the false charges that may be made against us because we're Christians, as they were made against Christians in the first century. But it's to glorify God. Now, the only true way God glorified us is when we honestly do His will. Jesus had much to say about doing His will and people seeing our good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven. They may not agree with you doing it. They may not do it themselves at all, but they recognize it's a good thing. 1 Peter 2 and, and verse 12, Peter brings out that the Gentiles may glorify God in the day of visitation. A visitation is when God draws near through some sort of mighty act of intervention, either judgment or salvation of some kind. Could either be the praise God will get at judgment day? I don't know. 
But you know, it's never wrong to do right. We must always learn that right from the Bible. God grants us salvation through the gospel system. In the day of the conversion to, to being a Christian, that all can praise God for such a good example, the light of the world, the salt of the earth, the leavening for good that is now created. And God expects us in the middle of a perverse generation, in the midst of great persecution, to still be what we ought to be. Christ did not cease living in harmony with God's will because he was persecuted. And he is our example. I wish we could appreciate, I speak personally, after all these years, of just how powerful a godly example is over others. Because they may take note of it and know how you live, and you may never know they're really knowing it. They're really paying any attention to it. But Matthew 5.16 makes it clear that our conduct before others makes a great deal of difference in what goes on in this world. In 1 Peter 3, and verse 14, he talks about suffering for righteousness. But, and if you suffer for righteousness' sake, and then he says something strange. It would be to the mind of the world. Happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror. Notice he didn't say it wasn't terror. He said, don't be afraid of their terror. Neither be troubled. That takes a lot of willpower and a lot of trust in God and doing things His way. Suffer without fear. Many worry and fret at the least little discomfort, and we out of all nations that have been on the earth had more comfort than I can think of anywhere. But the least little thing that gets out of joint or breaks down or and not comfortable, then we have some sort of spasm. And so we've raised a whole generation. i got a hangnail. I can't go to work. Come whimper and whine. We don't have the attitude of, it hurts to do what's right, but it's right, and I'm going to keep doing it. No, come, let's have a pity party. Let's all have a group session. And let's all cry. Say, oh, woe is me. That's supposed to get you over a thing. But you know what happens to a lot of those things? It perpetuates it. They're still moaning and groaning a year later in the same group. That doesn't make sense for what the Bible teaches that a Christian should be in his thinking. He even tells us, Paul does, the Thessalonians, he says, when, when you have a loved one die who's a Christian, don't sorrow like the people who have no hope. Well, what does it mean? They've just passed on to their reward. You're the one stuck back here. Live righteous so you can be with them again someday. Remember that Christians, that the Christians Peter's writing were the targets of persecution simply and only because they were Christians. People actually were searching them out. This is not, we might call it a random drive-by shooting, they were tormented for starting a fire that had nothing to do with at all. And it was just because they were Christians. Here's what Tacitus wrote, Roman historian. And I'm quoting. Consequently, to get rid of the report, Nero fastened the guilt and inflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class hated for their abomination called Christians by the populace. Then he went on to say, mockery of every sort was added to their deaths. Covered with the skins of beasts, they were torn by dogs and perished, or were nailed to crosses, or were doomed to the flames. These served to illuminate the night when daylight failed. What he did was coat them in tar and tie them to stakes up high and got dark, he set them on fire. And it is thought that somewhere around this time, this persecution, that possibly that's when Peter lost his life. We do not know that. Now, how can a Christian respond to suffering in a way that 
testifies to his Christianity by not fearing. That was the thing the Roman couldn't understand. He feared. Anything that would bump in the night scared him. He was a superstitious character. And everything that happened put him on edge. Not the Christians. They knew he was in control. And they did not fear what men would do to them. God told physical Israel not to fear, but to hold God in reverence. He did that through the great prophet Isaiah in chapter 8, 12 through 13. Our bodies may be beaten. They may be burned, crucified. But no man can touch my soul. And this body is not going to go into heaven anyway, for flesh and blood shall not inherit the kingdom of God. We're not to be dismayed at people who hate godly people. We're to simply keep doing what's right. We could be outlawed in this nation today. Does that change the teaching of the Bible? Does it change our lesson? the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Does it destroy the hope of heaven? None of it. Well, these brethren went through that when the church was being started in this world. Does the world see someone paralyzed by fear and anxiety? I love heaven. I'm a faithful servant of God. What's going to happen to me? You ever see that in any way come across any of Paul's writings? Peter's writings, John's writings, and what they told other Christians to do? No, they, they exhorted them to have a deep and abiding, obedient faith in the very face of adversity. And Peter would simply say, he's left us an example. Speaking of Christ's suffering, that we should walk in his steps. Because you see, it doesn't make any difference how long you live here in the flesh or how short a time you're here or whether you have a lot of money or no money or whatever is going on with you, an education or whatever. You die. And then what? I found that most people don't want to think about then what. But the Christian ought to be kept on then what. How much of the New Testament tells us about the hope, the expectation of heaven. That's where our reward is. Everything you do as a Christian, everything we're doing now, this sermon, our worship, all that you do in studying the Bible at home, trying to teach people, trying to set a godly example, you don't expect your full reward here. It's in heaven. And it won't be in this body. Are we ready to give a defense? Peter said in 1 Peter 3.15, that was our duty. We quote that a lot in apologetics. But sanctify the Lord God and the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer, which means apologia, to make a defense, give a reason for what you believe. To every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that's in you with meekness and fear. I really wonder how many people were converted because somebody said, I'm going over there and ask those people why they do these things. And if it's really true, they eat the blood and body of Christ. You know, so many things could be ironed out even among God's people. If we would just go to the source of the situation and say, is this actually what happened? You might be surprised to find out the answer is no, let me tell you what happened. Well, I wonder how many Bible studies of that day and time were opened up because they defended what they believed. I do know that when you get into the uninspired letters after the first century, especially what's called the early church fathers, unquote, is that they were writing letters to the emperor explaining what they were. Even after apostasy had started in the church, for two or three hundred years they were writing to the, to the emperor saying, here's what the situation is. They wanted to be known. They did not not mind being investigated, and we shouldn't either. I just wish we had a bunch of people around that wanted to investigate, that had that kind of interest. But we don't live in that age. Sanctify 
is to give reverence to Christ because of who Christ is. And to give him that special status in our hearts and thus in our lives. To be able to handle difficult, hard times, we have to focus on Christ. That means to know his word. That's the hope within us that we must be ready to defend. The hope is not, that hope is not in the world. We don't hold out false hope that everything will get better. You're selling yourself a bill of goods if you think, well, at some point out there in the future, everything will be a garden of Eden here on earth. Everything will be just fine. Know your history. How often in history has everything been just fine? As long as the devil has anything to do with it, and remember how he operates, it won't be just fine. And if he hates anybody on this earth, he hates us. And he seeks to destroy us. Is anybody going to really achieve world peace? Are the Democrats and Republicans going to sit down together and all of them be of the same mind and the same judgment? If they do, there'll be somebody else rise up and there won't be. Don't put your hope in political processes. If you can support something that's right, because the Bible defined it being right, because somebody's advocating, that's all fine. But our hope is in Christ and the gospel and godly living, because this world's not our home. Persecution and suffering to one extent or the other will not cease. Our hope our true biblical hope is in a better life to come, in a better world wherein dwelleth righteousness. In 1 Peter 1, 3 through 4, he talks about an inheritance waiting for us. We need to show people that we're not expecting glory in this world. And we must then to Keep a good conscience, 1 Peter 3.16. How can a Christian use foul gutter language or boast of carnal activities in the presence of non-Christians or to be accepted in the crowd, to go right along with them in their rebellion to God? How could a Christian believe that if they just show up on Sunday, it really doesn't matter what they do the rest of the week, how they live? Who they do it with. In bringing this lesson to a close, I want to read from history again. Not inspired history. But one early Christian who lived between 8100 and 130 wrote what is called the Epistle of Mathetis to Niognetus, chapter 5. It's entitled, The Manners of the Christians. For the Christians are distinguished from other men, neither by country, nor language, nor the customs which they observe. For they neither inhabit cities of their own, nor employ a peculiar form of speech, nor lead a life which is marked out by any singularity. The course of conduct which they follow has not been devised by any speculation or deliberation of inquisitive men. Nor do they, like some, proclaim themselves the advocates of any merely human doctrines. But inhabiting Greek as well as barbarian cities, and what they meant by that is, is any city that wasn't governed by Greek culture, but inhabiting Greek as well as barbarian cities, according as the lot of each of them has determined, and following the customs of the natives in respect to clothing, food, and the rest of their ordinary conduct, they display to us their wonderful and confessedly striking method of life. They dwell in their own countries, but simply as sojourners, as citizens, they share in all things with others, and yet endure all things as if foreigners. Every foreign land is to them as their native country, and every land of their birth as a land of strangers. They marry, as do all. They beget children, but they do not destroy their offspring. They have a common table, but not a common bed. 
They are in the flesh, but they do not live after the flesh. They pass their days on earth, but they are citizens of heaven. They obey the prescribed laws and at the same time surpass the laws of, the, of their life by their lives. They love all men and are persecuted by all. They are unknown and condemned. They are put to death and restored to life. They are poor yet make many rich. They are in lack of all things and yet abound in all. They are dishonored and yet in their very dishonor are glorified. They are evil spoken of and yet are justified. They are reviled and blessed. They are insulated and repay, or insulated, insulted and repay the insult with honor. They do good, yet are punished as evildoers. When punished, they rejoice as if quickened into life. They are assailed by the Jews as foreigners and are persecuted by the Greeks. Yet those who hate them are unable to assign any reason for their hatred. That sounds like to me somebody was listening to Peter and Paul and the way the Lord taught. And can we do better? So let us keep these things in mind as to what we have before us. And let us not become gloomy and despaired. However long we're on this earth, whatever manner or mode it is, an illness or accident or whatever that takes us out, let us continue to live one day at a time, like we always have anyway. And let us not say, oh, woe is me. I took another step. That's one more step toward the grave. You could have died when you were 20-something years old, but you didn't. Some of you haven't got to 20-something years old, and you hope you do. But they lived in a time when just for doing what we're doing here this morning, they would be persecuted, and that by the state itself. So if you would be a Christian such as Paul, such as Peter, such as John, if you would truly be a disciple of Christ as these brethren were, then rise up this morning and lay aside the affairs of this world and convert to Christ by believing in him, repenting of your sins, confessing your faith in him, and being baptized for the remission of your sins, and truly live a godly life in the church to which he adds you, when you're baptized. Why are, if you're not baptized, are you not baptized? Why are you not wanting to become a Christian? As a child of God, if you've sinned, you need to repent. You know you need to repent. I don't need to tell you that. That's God's second law of pardon. Confess those sins and pray for forgiveness. And to know that heaven is our home when we die in the faith. If you're subject to the Lord's great invitation, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.